<laughs> Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers, and um, I think we've got the things worked out here tonight. Um, so uh, we are going, it is the, it is November 5th, and we just restarted, um, so that's why, anyway, so hi. Um, welcome, Chris Sloan, Karen Fassenpower, and Kevin Hodgins. Um, um, I'll get it wrong every time, Kevin. Sorry. You'll see. Anyway, so I just, um, Kevin, Kevin um, just uh, put up a presentation a couple of weeks ago on K-12 online conference, which uh, Karen has been involved with too, and um, you're, you were the keynote for the gaming and gamification strand of the K-12 online conference. Um, and I got to say, I teach sixth and seventh graders, and I looked at your classroom. I said to you, this to you earlier, and I want to be in your class. <laughs> that looks like fun. Um, but at any rate, um, do you want to uh, introduce yourself and say a little bit about um, the what you put together? Um, because as I was watching, I kept saying, oh, the kids made games around, let me hear more about that. So we're going to get a chance to hear more about that here tonight. Yeah. Um, Welcome, Kevin. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, and hi, Karen. Hi, Chris. Uh, so my name is Kevin Hodgson. I teach sixth grade um, out in the town of Southampton in western Massachusetts. And I'm also a part of the Western Massachusetts Writing Project as well as one of the technology liaisons. Um, and I was honored to be asked to be part of the K-12 online conference uh, this year. Uh, I presented a couple times over the years, um, but not, not for a couple of years, I guess. Um, and um, there was a strand around uh, gamification this year. And when I was asked, I said, I'd love to do it, but um, I, it's not really gamification that I do. So as I was thinking about the keynote, I was trying to think about how to break that apart, uh, the kind of gaming idea into the different um, the different elements that it falls in. Maybe we'll talk more about that as we kind of move through um, our hour together. Um, and what I was going to focus in on was a program that we do uh, with my sixth graders. Um, and we'll actually be starting it up in just a couple of weeks. If, you know, we usually do it around the month of December or so. And it's really built around, well, you know, stepping back a little bit, where, where it came from was the realization um, very often um, that a lot of my kids were talking about the games that they were playing outside of school and how engaged they were um, in these different platforms that, quite frankly, I knew very little about. Um, and so the more I kind of talked to my students and the more I learned from them about the things that they were doing, the more I realized that I mean, here's a real authentic um, engagement that they're having in literacy, although they didn't see it that way. Uh, but I was noticing, you know, the things we were talking about. And, you know, would there be a way to kind of pull that idea into the classroom? And so that's kind of where it began for me. Yeah, and, and I just wanted to, I, I did make, want to make a note at the beginning that I think this story, and the way, one way to read your keynote presentation is it's a story of a teacher learning as much as anything. Mm. Yeah, That's I right. think I so. Yeah. yeah, and um, you know, even kind of thinking back a little bit to the the beginning. So after I after I noticed my students really engaged in um, in the video, particularly the video game that they're doing, um, what I started to do was trying to explore a little about kind of what does that look like and what would game design look like, um, and that led to um, actually through our writing project uh, we ran um, a summer camp. It's like a pilot program. Uh, we were looking for kind of youth engagement um, uh, programs over a summer, and I said, hey, let's do a video game design program. I never taught it or anything, you know. Uh, and it was one of those things where I said, if I get myself into it, I'm going to teach myself how to do it. Um, and that's kind of what happened. And what was really great about that summer camp was that the kids who came into there really had a wealth of experience on gaming that, you know, I really didn't have. Um, I think the lot that was of it, but so... Is that right? It was two summers ago, yeah. Yeah. Yep. And, how, many uh, kids, how many kids were involved? There were um, 16 kids involved. And um, and we kind of learned together. They taught me a lot of things. Um, and I brought things that I had kind of discovered on my own kind of into the uh, program. And these were middle school students, so 7th and 8th graders. Um, 
you know, anywhere between uh, 12 and 14 years old. Um, and one of the things we did was um, I started to invite uh, local game designers into the, into the summer camp to talk to the kids about what it's like to be a real game designer and real business. And I always told them beforehand, you know, make sure you push the literacy elements. And, they, and that was a natural part of the discussions anyway, though, about the connections, the collaboration, the writing that would go on, uh, the peer review. Uh, you know, they went through actually the whole process of how a game goes from idea to, you know, release as an app. Um, it was really fascinating. And, um, and the students at the camp really loved it, too, because, you know, that's kind of, you know, in their dream, you know, that, that was their kind of dream job sometime down the future. Um, so that experience really uh, had me thinking about, okay, how can I pull this into my sixth grade classroom, or at least in my school? And initially, my idea was I would run an after-school program. And so I even pitched it to the principal at the time and said, listen, I have this idea. Um, you know, how does it sound like we do an after-school gaming program? And he was, he was, uh, he loved that idea. And then the more I thought about it, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I, I just want to, I, I mean, I think what, what is happening in the National Writing Project at the same time is all this, is all of the hacking on games and so forth that, mm -hmm. you know, I always see you doing that too, right? I mean, yeah. in those workshops. Do, can you speak to that a little bit as, as some of your inspiration, or is that not necessarily true? Um, yeah, I think because that's part of how we introduce uh, gaming to our students. Um, but, so I'll get to that one second. This, this is sure. an important point, I think, for me. Okay, sorry to um, interrupt. <laughs> no, it's okay. Your principal, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, so he was all up for this, uh, you know, an after-school program. But the more I thought about it and the more I realized that, um, you know, we had, we had done a couple of uh, National Writing Project conferences where we walked around, I remember it was in Philadelphia, I think, and we walked around all these great programs, and I realized, you know, these are all after-school programs targeted for these small groups of kids, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, they did open them up for scholarships and stuff like that, but it, it, it just always unsettled me that those are the kids that get those innovative programs, and why can't we pull that into the classroom for everyone? So I scrapped that whole kind of after-school idea and decided that we would do a game design unit as part of our... Um, you know, part of our writing classroom, basically. Um, and so that's when I really first kind of pulled it in. And what we did was um, I teamed up with my science teacher who uh, teaches a whole geology unit um, where she was struggling with the vocabulary of the students really um, using the vocabulary on geology uh, with plate tectonics and all sorts of things. Um, and we were trying to brainstorm ways that they could use that vocabulary in a really meaningful way and I thought, well, game design is like perfect for that because geology, you could build a whole game that kind of metaphorically represents, you know, going down to the center of the earth, um, coming up to a volcano, you know, the adventure stories and movies that seem that kind of pull in those storylines. Um, so that's really where our kind of whole unit came around, is really molding that idea of uh, reinforcing what was going on in science class, uh, but then pulling in the game design unit as part of that and really trying to think of it from a lens of literacy. So um, a lot of the uh, you know, things related to that we do that that is actually not even near the computer, not even near the game design, um, has to do with um, you know, storyboarding out the story, because they are telling the story as part of it. Um, working in the vocabulary into the, uh, the text and the kind of things they're going to say in there. Um, of reviewing games that they play and doing podcasts where they uh, we published uh, their game reviews uh, uh, first on our website, but then actually um, two years ago it got picked up by a national uh, game design and a review site, and they were they were posting the podcasts you know to their audience. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of peer review goes on; they do reflections uh, all along the way. And so, you know, if we step back, you know, they see it as game design, but I see it more like a literacy kind of idea. And kind of how we lead into that is a lot of this uh, hacking board games. Um, so uh, particularly around chess and card games where we spend time, you know, playing games, um, and they bring in games too, and then we talk about, okay, how would you redesign this game? Um, how would you, uh, you know, hack the rules and kind of make it something completely new? And, um, you know, our good friend Chad is somebody who's really kind of inspired me in that direction of, of thinking about any game uh, can be remixed into something new. And then, okay, so then the expository, you know, comes in, like, how do you explain to somebody else, another group in the room, how to play your game? And so, you know, working in the writing elements of that and rethinking, it's really fascinating to watch kids kind of work on that and try to break out of um, their expectations of 
a game that they know by heart. And now you have to make it something new. So you've been doing this now for two years? Sorry. Actually, I'm thinking of three years now. Three years. Yeah, three years. And your principal yeah. was cool with you bringing it into the curriculum or had some questions, or how did that work out? Um, he um, he had some questions about it. Yeah, you know, he wanted to know where the connections were to our curriculum, and uh, you know, so we talked it through, and um, he he was very supportive of it. Um, he has since left. We had an interim principal last year. Mm -hmm. She was really supportive of it, and I have a new principal this year. I haven't talked to her yet about it, uh, but I've shared I've shared uh, you have some videos you could share. Yeah. Yeah. I have, yeah, and uh, so she knows that we kind of do it. Um, and, um, you know, parents, uh, for the most part, have been very supportive of it. Uh, I've had some questions of parents about, you know, wanting me to explain more, the rationale for why we're, you know, why their kids are designing video games in school. Um, and uh, we've had some discussions around parents who don't want that much screen time for their kids and, you know, how to kind of balance that out. Um, you know, all legitimate, I think, parent issues around that. Um, and... Um, we use, uh, you know, as our main publishing site, at least still at this point, is uh, is GameStar Mechanic, uh, which I, I know, Paul, you've kind of used a little bit in the past, too. And it has limitations, uh, but also for beginning game designers, I think it, it does a nice job of walking the kids through the different elements. Um, and then also what I like is that it, it provides an authentic publishing site for them, for other kids to play their games. And they can actually get feedback on their games and... Um, you know, for your own game, you can even kind of pull up, um, if you have a multi-level game, like where people have abandoned your game and talk about that role between too challenging and too easy and kind of where that fits and a lot of different dynamics around game design that get pulled into those discussions. Yeah, I did, that was one point, and then Karen and Chris, please, this might be a place to interrupt and add some questions too. But that was one point in the uh, K-12 online conference um, presentation that you did that I wanted to hear more, so maybe you can say more at some point here, about you, you said in the, in the conference that, the, um, that you really liked how they paid attention to, you know, teaching on, on the site. So I was wanting to hear more examples of that, perhaps. Hmm. That, yeah, I think that, uh, you know, the way the way the GameStar site is set up is that you have to work your way through a series of quests as a player. Um, and those quests are actually built around design models of teaching you how to design games. So um, there are places where, let's say, the challenge is uh, of tinkering with the gravity levels. So uh, a character can't kind of reach where they need to reach unless you go into the settings and play around and kind of make that the perfect kind of gravity level. Or... Um, different kind of blocks or different kind of um, reward systems, um, health systems. You know, they um, they basically break parts of the game and force the player to fix it in order to move into the quest to the next level. And you actually can't publish a game until you've gone through the whole first quest itself. And they're so not. That, they don't take too long. <laughs> they do take a little bit of time, definitely. Um, and so part of the challenge for me as a teacher is allocating enough time for kids to be able to do that because um, although, you know, there are some kids who go home <laughs> and they're through the quest in like a day or two um, I, because they have a computer, they have the access or whatever it happens to be, you know, I can't take that for granted. So I have to make sure that all my students in my class... Uh, the ones who have no access at home, um, the ones who aren't really gamers, too, you know, all have that opportunity to kind of get through where they are. And just like a lot of things with technology that we probably have all noticed is it's amazing how um, kids help each other out um, and ask for help from their peers in, in, in ways that, you know, sometimes I'm not e it's like I'm not even in the room, you know. They're in groups helping each other kind of work their way through the most difficult parts of that quest or the stage where it happens to be. And the expertise that kind of comes to the surface is um, not always the ones who are usually the ones at the surface of those kids. It's, it's often a different kind of group of, of uh, students who, um, you know, their, their interests are suddenly the thing that is driving this kind of project. And, you know, they emerge as leaders in really interesting ways. I love seeing that, by the way. <laughs> GameStar Mechanic is uh, uh, you buy a license, you buy licenses, and 
when you talked about going home, I was wondering how that how you handle that. So um, yeah. you, there are licenses after the first quest. The, the first quest, uh, you know, that whole kind of first section is free. Um, so what we do is we actually set them up in accounts in the classroom, um, and and they create usernames and passwords. Um, actually, then I keep a database of that for them because I can't tell you how often they forget their password um, or their Sex username too. Yeah. I know. So uh, <laughs> so we have access to that um, as part of that to allow them to kind of get through there. Now I still have students actually in my because you can set up classrooms too. Um, from you know the first year we did it, um, that are still on there, so they're in you know high school now, um, still on there and making some games. The you know the number dwindles kind of down and down, and I usually winnow out kids from our classroom too if I see there's been no activity. Uh, but the, at that point, you know they have to buy the license for their family if they want to keep going and keep all the stuff they've earned. But so, so yes, so they can work at home too or not? Oh yeah, yep. Okay, so. Yep. Once they have the license, they can do it. So yeah. your school purchases the license. Yes, we have a license that can allows us to have a certain number of kids. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Chris, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I um, wanted to talk about um, Kevin. I noticed, like in your um, the presentation, there seemed to be a conscious effort from the uh, organizers to gamify the conference, and. Um, I uh, I kind of I was interested in in as I played your game, um, mm -hmm. just the first level, uh, kind of monitoring my reaction as I went through, and I thought like um, it was a really interesting way to get people uh, into PD because like you know I was a little disoriented when I was um, first dropped into the place where the you know the PD dragons are. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but you know, like that actually got kind of I think my adrenaline going, or you know, uh, maybe raised my heart rate or something. You know, like it was interesting in a different kind of way, and um, and so I thought that was um, you know, like just monitoring my own uh, reactions to playing the game mm -hmm. uh, made me I think physiologically more interested in your presentation. Too. Um, I don't know, like, what, when you all started thinking about this... Chris, what happened to you? It made you physically, physiologically <laughs> more interested? Do you want to... Right. So, like, you know... What the hell does that mean? So, you know, you, 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 there's this game, you know... Yeah. No, I'm just giving you that. Yeah, and I didn't want to get caught you don't by the dragon. dragon. <laughs> so, like, I was invested in the actual game itself, like, having... Uh, you know, a physiological reaction to the game, you know, like, I mean, you do in all games. Yeah, you know? yeah. yeah. I, I think that's, I mean, there's a whole element of gaming that's part of that. So, it's funny because um, that was not like a planned, and Karen conducts this, I mean, that was a spur of the moment um, idea that, you know, how can, how can we get people who are watching the K-12 videos maybe engaged a little more? Uh, so this is just me on the outside, and I'm not even on the planning team or anything like that, and Karen can jump in if she wants to. But, you know, the idea for me is that, uh, and I've noticed this a couple of years with the K-12, there's great programs on there, and then I look and, like, nobody's commented on anything. And I know people are probably watching it, but, like, there's, no, there's not enough interaction for the kind of PD that I like, particularly in kind of online, you know, courses and other things where, I want to know what people are thinking and interact with them. And um, so the idea was uh, that I, I just kind of, you know, I was thinking, and I think there were some other people who kind of were saying it too, like, you know, how can we yeah, gamify, I guess is the word. I'm not really big on, I don't really like that term that much. But, you know, just a way to kind of engage people more in the conference. Um, so um, actually what I did was... Um, the kind of the Google, so I don't know if you made it to the Google Doc, which is after the yeah, video yeah. game part. Um, that was uh, really a variation of something that I started to put together over the summer with the Making Learning Connected MOOC, where in our gaming um, um, make cycle, um, you know, people were talking about like we should figure out a way to kind of integrate this idea of you know game design into the whole experience of the MOOC itself. Um, and so I kind of done all this work, and then we kind of fell apart, and I just kind of forgot about it. <laughs> and then, uh, and then K twelve was like, oh, I should just pull back someone's ideas and see if they can be adapted for this, you know, and really low stakes too. Like the dragons, Chris, would not harm you at all because I made them no damage at all. 
Um, and I did this on purpose, too, because I wanted to be very simple for people who had never, you know, played a video game to be able to get to the gold block that'll give them the key to get to the, you know, the chart with the kind of rules. I want really, like, almost no stakes at all. Um, but I'm glad it's, you know, they scared you a little bit because, you know, those PD providers are scary. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you don't want to run into them. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think kind of having the video game lead into the next piece uh, was just a kind of simple kind of one kind of media to the next idea. Um, and it, re it was really just another tool for engagement, which is really, you know, I guess if we're thinking of the gamification idea, that's really what it's about. It's trying to engage learners in, in, in different ways, um, using some game design elements. Uh, but, you know, as I said in the keynote, too, is, you know, I really don't use gamification necessarily in my classroom because I've had trouble seeing the vision of it and how it really worked and you know, I've tinkered with little pieces of it here and kind of see it work for some kids and not others and not enough where I've kind of invested myself in it. Um, so, um, so can we say a little more about that? I mean, I didn't want to lead off with that, but this feels like a good moment. Um, so why does gamification um, make us nervous or feel kind of icky or something? Karen, you, really, you mentioned yeah. that. Oh, I'm happy to jump in on that. I, I mean, I'm not a fan of gamification, and I think, um, especially in professional learning, I, I worry, and this is something I've thought a lot about with P2PU and badges, and I worry mm -hmm. that it's about sort of carrots and sticks instead of really wanting to, to encourage learning for its own sake. And I, I mean, I think, you know, there's benefits of carrots and sticks, and they do seem to make people do things. But I wonder, like, in what context that makes sense. And I think my concern with, um, with youth in gamification is that we're perpetuating, like, this giant scorekeeping, game playing in life thing. And I, I think, you know, when... <sighs> There, there are kids who are good at school as a game, and I was one of those kids. And, you know, I could figure out what you were supposed to do at school, and I was just better at it than anybody. Like, I was a great test taker. But then now as an adult, I look back and I think I didn't – I mean, at the most superficial level, I didn't learn what I should have learned. I learned how to play the game of school. At a bigger level, I think it set me up for a lot of years of adult life of – playing some game of keeping score that took me a long time to figure out, like, that's maybe not what makes me happy in life. So, I mean, that's kind of a big philosophical thing, but that's the, I would say that's the underpinning of my concerns with gamification. Mm. Kevin, what are you thinking? I think, uh, I think I agree with Karen on a lot of points. Um, I also think I don't have a good enough handle on it to, like, pull it in and make it successful, and so... Or at least I haven't seen a model that that I can say yes, you know, that's exactly how it would work in my classroom, right? So because I have a discomfort level of trying to figure it out, um, I haven't really bought into it. Um, and I agree that one of my concerns is this idea of um, of not just the competitive nature, but that um, a learning is a point somehow, and you know how to kind of make that real, like for my students who I want the kind of learning to be the reason why they're learning and not the reward. And sometimes it reminds me of, um, you know, there are still some teachers in my school who use accelerated reader, which mm -hmm. drives me completely crazy. Um, and, you know, the kids come up and say, you know, I read all these books, got all these points, I was reading six, seventh grade level books, and they can't comprehend anything they've read, they can't make any inferences, they can't make critical analysis of the te you know, all the things that I want them to be as readers, um, you know, that they wouldn't call it a game, I'm sure, but it is, you know, because it's, you know, you're earning your points based on the number of, you know, everything you read. Um, and it just is, a for me, a very poor example of how that motivation factor, because they are highly motivated, but it's meaningless learning a lot of ways to me. And... Um, and often with students, it's like I have to reteach them how to read, <laughs> you know, unfortunately. Uh, but, you know, I think about, like, when you were talking about the kids <laughs> learning science terms, mm -hmm. I think that does seem pretty promising from at least the way you described it. Like, I can imagine, um, you know, a kid really not very excited about the terms, 
and then you know creating these games. I would think that would be a success story of gamification in your own classroom, right? Yeah, but I don't think of it as gamification. I think that um, I mean that's a, I think of it. I really do distinguish between the gamification idea, which is your classroom becomes the gaming environment, and a game design project where you're designing something specific. Uh, maybe I'm just kind of dividing it up a lot, but I really I have distinct ideas. It's an important about distinction. That. Yeah. Go ahead, Jim. And, and I think too that I was really happy when uh, when uh, the K-12 people actually uh, stretched out that gamification title and added game design in there or gaming or whatever it was, uh, because I was I knew what kind of presentation I was going to give around, and it's it's not gamification. Um, you know, it's game design as a liter you know literacy event. Um, and so, um, you know, that, that point is really, uh, for me, was really important to kind of make, I think. So, um, I, uh, I was going to ask for a clarification of terms there. Um, so I saw your slide, game design looked a lot like writing process. Mm. And then, so, what's the definition of gamification? <laughs> um... Let's see. Uh, I don't know if I'm we're, we're probably not. none of us here are experts on it, so we should. <laughs> we're pro but oh. well, I, you know, the way I see it is, is um, it's you're creating a learning environment. So let's think of the classroom, right? Or um, you know, the quest to learn schools, right? Where the whole school is kind of built around the idea that the challenges are in place where um, you. It's not always points though, but you earn kind of something by getting, getting past the challenge, or might, that challenge might be collaboration, so there's a lot of positive elements to it, too. Um, and, but everything is kind of built around this idea of there are problems to be solved, and inquiry will kind of, and collaboration will get you past those, and there are certain rewards for you kind of on the other side. Um, and I think places that do it well, it's not a point system, it's not a badge system, it's not, you know, that kind of thing. They have other kind of systems that are built in place around uh, recognition or other things that might make it work. So trying to kind of balance the kind of what other people would say who believe in it. And I would say from the K-12 online conference, we talked a lot about the difference that game, you know, we started with the strand being just gamification and then we talked about expanding it to include gaming and that that was really I mean, we always said gaming and gamification are really different things. And I think, you know, you did, you, you described it well, Kevin. It's, it's using, using game elements to advance learning is gamification. And it's not, you know, it's not necessarily, it's, it's different than gaming, which is a lot broader. And then I think you took it to a whole nother level in your presentation through game design, which is, mm -hmm. which I just loved. I mean, I just, I was so happy. I, I would, you know, I said I'm not a big fan of gamification. And I wasn't, I was interested in what your take on it was, and I just, I watched your session, and I was just like, this is so excellent, because it is, it's a different angle, and it's a bigger picture. Um, and I think it taps into a lot of the good things of both, but it's different than gamification. Yeah. And so. without going into a lot of detail, um, but the PDPU badge system that I set up, and if you still go to youthvoices.net slash play, right? Right. I experimented with organizing curriculum around a play notion. Um, you know, so I was going to ask kinda, you about that, Paul, because yeah, kind of learning you know, from the and so forth. To, um, but but the but the moment and and so I just want to get to the question. The moment that that you know was really clear is when when students said, "This isn't fun." <laughs> <laughs> So, so yeah, I mean, you can set up a lot of uh, structures for kids, yeah. but if it's not fun, it's uh, it's not a game. But right? it was I mean, motivational, that sounds... right? Because I, mean, I remember talking yeah, to kids. I mean, I, I'm not saying we didn't learn something out that big chart. Yeah. And, I mean, that chart was like a map to them. Mm -hmm. And I've never seen, I haven't seen kids, I mean, every every classroom has a scope and sequence and a, and a path of instruction. I've never been, I don't think, in any other classroom where kids pulled out a chart and said, this is what I have to do, and I'm here, and I have to do this and this to get credit. And so I'm wondering if that served a purpose. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't think, yeah. I So I bring it up as, as saying it's something that we're all working on. You know, it's just that that we don't want bad games, right? We want 
fun games and, and motivating games. So I yeah, I wouldn't give up on the idea, but I don't know if we're there yet. I but and I also wanted to to um, admit something. Uh, sorry, my my phone right started keeping track of my footsteps right. So it, which which reminded me of Game of Right, it absolutely is yeah. Game of and, and I got really, I mean, at first I was like, ah, oh, what the hell is this, right? But then, <laughs> then you're I like, started having fun, and I started <laughs> making myself goals, and, like, I, I get 10,000 before 10 o'clock, and I'm happy, and it's like, and, 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 but, but, so, so, and there's, a lot, lot, like, a lot of other data, health kind of data that the phones keep now, which is gamification, isn't it? It, I mean, it is, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, personal um, gamification, right? I mean... What? That idea of personal gamification is, is I mean, the, the, the new Apple Watch, right, is designed with all those health apps on there because uh, mm. they're trying to tap into that idea of people keeping track of their health, uh, yeah. their footsteps, um, you know, and, yeah, all that kind of data analysis, which, uh, that's the kind of a goal setting. Which doesn't sound much different than Accelerated Reader on some level, right? Um, so I'm thinking about... Saying, so, but so how is it different, like... It, it's different because I choose to do it. I choose when I, you know, want to tell somebody else about the data I achieved or didn't achieve, right? I mean, there's could it be, choices. Could it be there. different in that it's your goal to begin with yeah. to have some fitness thing? So yeah. I'm thinking, like, I'm so outspoken about badges and gamification and hating this all, and I'm thinking right now about NaNoWriMo, which I'm, like, obsessing about word count. <laughs> and every day I'm posting my numbers and I'm looking. Yeah. And I'm well, like, okay, so... That is motivating to me. Like, there's probably, I don't know, there's probably no other month I write 75,000 words or 50,000 words or whatever. But it's my goal. It's like, I want to write a novel. So maybe there's a way to gamify around students' own goals or something that would make more sense. I don't know. Well, I mean, in motivation theory, you know, there's the woman, Dweck, who talks about you know you have learning or any orientation goals or you have performance orientation and so like you know like it sounds like the the bad gamification is about performance I just want to win you know but um, if if my orientation is learning then you know it's not so much dependent on how I'm doing compared to everybody else it's like I'm into it so like your nano Rimo, you know, you're into it for your own learning, and Paul's into it for his own fun, and, and that seems good. Yeah. I'm glad you brought up the fun thing, because I kept thinking, learning? No, it's about fun. <laughs> right. But, yeah. I but mean, it's at least because we, so, it's yours, you know. <laughs> getting back to Kevin's motivation for getting involved in all of this, it was noticing that the kids are involved in the games, right? And yeah. So... Yeah. Um, so I, I want to get back to your story a little bit, if you can. Okay. Um, <laughs> but I mean, I think I think we I think the, that that little uh, sidebar was really important. I think that's interesting, guys. But say more about how you're using game design, if you can. Well, you so worry, I think up again. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, you know, one of the things we noticed is um, so I I along with the partnership with our science teacher. And by the way, she just told me today, oh, I'm not doing geology now till the end of the year. She switched it with, like, cells. So now i got to revamp my whole, hey, you know. come on. Cells are gamey. <laughs> cells would be great, yeah. <laughs> um, but, um, but I was like, oh, there you tell me. But anyway, uh, I also um, uh, co-teach a class, too. So um, a special ed a teacher and myself have been co-teaching for a number of years. Um, and so we ch- try to really pay attention to our, um, our struggling students, too, um, who are in there with us. And what the kind of game unit does around motivation for them. And we've really kind of tried to keep an eye on that. And, you know, we've noticed that those, uh, a lot of those students, not all of them, but it, speaking very generally here, that a lot of our struggling writers write more in the month uh, when we do our game design than really um, any other time of the year. And sometimes, um, you know, sometimes it keeps going into the new year and sometimes it kind of fades out again a little bit. But... Um, but we, they're highly motivated to do the uh, peer reviews. They're highly motivated to do their uh, story maps. Um, when we're reviewing other games, um, they kind of see themselves in, kind of in a way as writers that 
Uh, the other kind of writing elements we do for the year doesn't engage them nearly as much. Um, so in mean, that part of it, I think how to reach all learners, um, you know, the unit really kind of opens itself up. And the ones who are really advanced, I mean, there's enough room for them to, you know, to take it to another level, so to speak, um, beyond the kind of basics of what we're expecting. And, and kind of push it in different directions. And I know this year, actually, I have some kids already who are, you know, who are already kind of into coding and, um, you know, want to learn, you know, way beyond probably even what I kind of know. Um, but I can see already that I'm going to have to find some ways to kind of really challenge them uh, even beyond our kind of basic gaming unit, um, which is great, I think. Um, and, and opening that up for them to be the ones to kind of show me the way, too, I think is really important uh, from a teaching perspective. Um, so, like, thinking of how you reach all sorts of students um, across the spectrum, I think, is really important as, you know, as I think about uh, setting up this kind of game design unit um, and kind of what it means for writing in my classroom, which is really why I do it. I mean, yeah, gaming is fun and, you know, the kids are motivated, but what I really want to do is teach them how to write um, in the different forms of writing persuasive writing when we do our reviews, right? Um, expository writing when they're explaining how to play their game. Um, creative writing when they're making out their story in their, you know, story maps and their stories. Um, thinking about visual design elements. Um, thinking about just game design around challenge and um, and uh, color design in there. You know, how do you metaphorically represent the layers of the earth through colors? Like, what would it look like? Um, you know, those kind of things are really interesting conversations to have. Um, around the room when they're in the midst of doing all that. So I, I, I'm glad you mentioned coding there because that was one of my questions. GameStar Mechanic teaches coding, you think? Um, in... No. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I mean, they, no. So, so uh, where does, how does code, so what else are you doing that's teaching coding? Or, well, um, you know, we, um, we participate in the Hour of Code projects uh, last year and we'll do it again this year. Um, and it's, um, you know, it's funny because coding is one of those things where I have to struggle with bringing it to the whole, the whole classroom mm -hmm. uh, because there are a lot of kids who um, are kind of interested in it, but there's a whole group that really have no interest at all, and it's just like <laughs> they throw a dead weight into the room sometimes of trying to get them really engaged in, in just the rationale. Okay, why, you know, and I've had that question. Why are you teaching me about, you know, you know, HTML on this, you know, thimble page or whatever, and it's like that. Um, you know, and I have my whole spiel of, listen, the technology we use is there's a whole layer beneath it, and you have to have some understanding of what's going on there in order to make the technology work for you in the way that you need to work for you. It doesn't mean you're going to become a, a designer of apps in your life, necessarily, or that you're going to become a computer programmer. Um, but you want to know the basics so that um, you're, you know, you're in control to some degree of your phone or your, you know, laptop or the websites that you're on. And um, so, you know, I basically I give I give the same spiel, and when you know when we do Scratch and, um, but I but I also sometimes feel like I'm um you could say almost a grammar teacher could almost say the same thing about writing. <laughs> yeah. So you know, I mean. Yeah, so so just and just a, a, a quick example that that's like bouncing around in my head. There's a, there's a teacher right now on Youth Voices and with the with us was with us this summer, who introduced Paltoons right to us mm -hmm. at the same time as we were introducing Scratch to her. Mm -hmm. She's like, well, why do I have to do all this coding? And right. <laughs> We can just drag and drop stuff, you know. <laughs> and, and her kids are make are, are yeah. creating these beautiful uh, immigration stories, right? Um, so, and yeah, so it's just a question. I'm not sure. I mean, you know, I I value all of it, but yeah. You know. Well, they're almost yeah. There's two <laughs> different things in a way, right? Like, so the Paladins is a presentation software. Yeah. Right, that you're telling story. Oh. Yeah, but I mean, uh, that's somehow that's somewhat how Scratch can be used too. Yeah. 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 Yeah, they're different. I I see the difference, but <laughs> anyway. I've struggled with Scratch too. I think when I've brought it in the class, I think you and I have had a kind of conversation about this before. Actually, that um, the well, kids. The, 
The kids lost interest quickly because there wasn't enough bang for the buck. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Did you use it for game design? Um, We uh, I used it for animation, Mm -hmm. thinking that that would lead us into game design. Actually, that that was part of like the summer camps. We kind of brought it in, Um, and the kids were like, "Yeah, it doesn't interest me at all." And you know, even looking at some of the mentor kind of games, they're like, you know, it's just. It takes too long to get that little kind of thing to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, so even with all my kind of pushing of, or not pushing, but you know, um, you know, the, the front of the room teacher, I'll say, "This is you know, teaching programming is all blah blah blah, blah right?" And uh, but they they yeah they didn't buy that. So. When kids find Game Star Mechanic too limiting, where do you take them next or send them next or? <laughs> well, usually what happens is by the time they find it too limiting, we're done with our unit. <laughs> no, um. um <laughs> No, I I often at the end will we'll do a whole brainstorming session about okay where would you go next if you were interested in it? and they'll kind of name some different things. Um, most of them I'm actually not even really aware of uh, because it is much more advanced gaming. Um, and um, now you know they're all of course um, you know there's so many Minecraft kids um, right. that um, you know they see unlimited potential in what they're doing in Minecraft, which is a very different kind of gaming environment than. You know, Game Star and some other ones, um, and so yeah. So how, many, how many of your kids are are as you just said Minecraft kids, and how do you find out? Um, we usually do a survey about gaming at the beginning of the unit. Um, you know, my guess is just you know thinking kind of in terms of discussions I've had is just probably about. I would say about 50 or 60 percent who play Minecraft, but probably like 20 percent are the hardcore Minecrafters. And I can even see at the beginning of the year with like stories and other yeah. That's a, that's a bigger group than you could probably point to anybody, any other site that kids in sixth grade are doing. Do I agree. 20 percent of your class. I mean, yeah. I mean, I think, uh, and I see it reflected in like stories we did at the beginning of the year where I'm noticing like the setting is in Minecraft, you know, and. Um, and when they do artwork, it's all block-based uh, Minecraft character. You know, <laughs> it's like, wow, this is really like, <laughs> this is their culture, you know, right now, and it's interesting. And I like that it's open-ended too. You know. Open-ended because they can take it wherever they'd like, or yeah, yeah. And I know a lot of teachers have done pretty amazing things, you know, or beginning to kind of really explore that. Um, in, in interesting ways. So. so is that part of your unit or not, Minecraft? No, it's not. Mm-hmm. No. And, you know, although I love to kind of move in that direction, I think, um, you know, then it starts taking over my year. And so, you know, game design is kind of a part of kind of what I do through the course of the year, and I have to be conscious of that, too. It takes us to about, a, you know, I would say from, the, from when we start talking about game design, to when we published our games, I mean, that's probably like a six-week cycle right there. And it's not every day, because we're doing other things too, but I mean, that's a long stretch of time. So when I talk to teachers about the game, you know, unit we do, you know, that can be a deal breaker, because that's actually a big part of the year, if you think about it. So How many hours um, a week, roughly? I would say in a typical week, uh, for a typical class, right, where, because I have four classes that come in for an hour a day. Um, we would probably spend, like we're in the midst of it, um, I'd say about two and a half hours a week in class. And then, you know, some of them are working at home. Uh, that's probably what we allocate. And I was wondering about that from, um, you know, like teachers will say, like, um, I can't fit that into my curriculum because I have to do all this test stuff. Um, But I mean, you're saying that um, it seems like the way you do it, um, like their literacy seems to be enhanced by this. I mean, you Uh don't face the same pressures or? Uh, We do uh, uh, have those pressures. Uh, I think we, right now, we have a little more freedom than some other schools. Um, but we certainly have the testing pressure, you know, on us a lot. Um, but I think it's been helpful to be able to justify um, the literacy elements and the science connections and the cross-discipline 
um, elements that go into the project uh, to the point where um, the administration kind of believes in it. Um, and so far, we're kind of trying to ride that, <laughs> you know. Um, and, uh, and so far, it's been successful. Kevin Osborne, welcome. Hi. Hi, Paul. Hey, Kevin. Good to see you again. Um, uh, so I, I just started teaching Scratch at the, well, actually, it's been about four weeks now uh, at Newton Community Ed. I've done a few, like, one-off classes before, but, like, I'm, I'm doing a 14-week session uh, in, you know, our, our, our local community ed, and I'm doing, like, four classes. What, what ages are you doing? Uh, it's, like, fourth and fifth graders. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's been interesting. I mean, it's, it's a mixed bag. I, I heard some of what Kevin said about uh, about about his experience, uh, and uh, definitely some kids are more interested in playing games, and and so. Uh, but uh, I've had really good luck with girls. Um, girls seem to really like Scratch because mm -hmm. uh, there's sort of a storytelling element to it, I think, and uh, and they also uh, uh, it's it's easier to get them to team up on stuff. Um, uh, although uh, actually some of the boys actually team up on things too. They 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 do actually kind of like if you can get them to work together, it's really really pretty 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 sweet. Um, introducing some of the game concepts also seems to get their interest a little bit too. I used to write video games for Atari a long time ago, and so it was uh, you know sort of talking about like well how do you keep track of lives and health and things like that. Um, you know, makes them think about how to do it, and then, and then, you know, that that seems to get their their interest a little bit. It's I wouldn't mm -hmm. say it's universally successful, but, but um, but some kids definitely run with it. The gender thing is interesting, and I wrote I wrote about this kind of recently, thinking about it um, as part of a kind of bigger issue. Um, of really uh, trying to be very conscious of uh, making sure the girls in my classes are really included and uh, and feel kind of in welcoming that kind of gaming environment uh, because we know sometimes that in the world that's not the case um, and really trying to make sure that um, they're empowered by kind of what we're doing and you know the kind of generalized reality is that they girls typically that I've noticed over the years um, Make such better games than the boys. <laughs> um, I mean, their games are much more rich with uh, storytelling, uh, much more rich with thinking through the challenge areas. Um, and, uh, and I'm speaking kind of generally because they've had some boys who make great games too. But um, but I think there's you know um, there's something of the storytelling element that um, can be a, a nice hook in for a lot of kids who maybe don't see themselves as gamers or don't even play games because you know there are kids in my classroom who are just not only would they never self-associate as a gamer, um, they really don't play games at all. Um, so trying to keep them motivated and, and show them why we're doing this um, is a challenging part of, of not doing it as a club, you know, where it's a self-selected group that comes because they're gamers. Uh, when you do it for the broad audience, um, there's a justification you have to do as a teacher, even to 11-year-olds, about why we're doing this. Um, and so, you know, those make for really interesting conversations with people in the classroom. Kevin, uh, any have you used Game Star Mechanic with? No, I haven't. Uh, I, I don't, uh, some of my kids were re me were saying, "Oh, this is not as good as some other uh, game." I forget. I forget the wor game workshop or whatever. Uh, but like I said, well, yes, but it's not going to teach you how to program. <laughs> and I said, I said, if you want to, like, you know, and and this this actually. It's really funny because, like, after I said this, yeah, can I can I just yeah. can I just ask about that though? I mean, isn't there a part of you that feels like, I don't know, like they didn't ask the program. They want to play. They want to make a game. <laughs> That's true. That's true. <laughs> so, like, who are you to say you learned a program? <laughs> well, that's what that's what their their parents want. <laughs> <laughs> that's what they're paying for, right? I don't know. So. Uh, I don't know. Uh, you're right. You're right. Um, uh, I don't know. I think, if I'm right. I don't know. Well, well. So, so the thing I said to them is that. So, if you're interested, for example, like you know, I've got some Minecraft kids, and uh, I said, if you want to do a Minecraft mod, you're going to have to write that in Java, and if you want to learn Java, you're going to have to program. And so, Scratch isn't actually too far from that. I mean, because that that the whole idea of Scratch was that, well, it's visual, 
it actually gives you the the like the words there, and, and so that you could actually translate that into a sort of a written programming language. So the leap from sort of drag and drop blocks to writing code isn't too far. And then that that's really part of their stated purpose in in the design of Scratch. And I've been going to Scratch Day for like many years. Uh, I, I'm following the lifelong kindergarten group, uh, and uh, and that that you know that's that's. That's, I mean, I have my complaints about Scratch. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but that's a, uh, uh, yeah. That was so, a helpful description. I think. Yeah, yeah, I think. Good. Relate, relating it to Minecraft is, is 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 a good thing, I think, too. Yeah, that's a good connection. I'm just thinking too of a session that we went to at uh, it was last year's NWP around Scratch, and you know what was most powerful I think, from that story is the community of kids that are remixing each other's projects um, and giving feedback and I can't even remember the numbers they were talking about but it was pretty astonishing from around the world um, you know as really a social um, gaming space or it's not all gaming though, it's animation too so it's, uh, you know social technology space where um, kids were doing uh, you know publishing things and allowing other people to remix them and then you can follow the trail of the remix of your project like because uh, it shows you who's done what with your piece and I think that is really a you know powerful part of Scratch in some ways for me kind of more than actually the, the kind of programming of it um, you know yeah. the kind of making things. Yeah well, I had one, one girl who was just completely she had no idea what to do she had no idea I don't think she had any idea why she was even there and then she found <laughs> She found, I mean, literally. I mean, it was really frustrating for me. I was like, it was like, it was like, uh, I was like, I wanted to like scream, like, "Why are you here?" <laughs> it was like, it's like, so, uh, and and so, uh, but she, she, it's so funny because she was so persistent about not knowing, <laughs> which is uh, there's a Zen koan there, I think, uh, but uh, but she she discovered this like canine creator, which where you build your own dog. Uh, and scratch thing, and and that totally fascinated her, and she did you know like try to remix it, and she did some she, she made some changes, and she actually I think she learned a little bit about it, and now she's trying to she she decided that it was um, cheating, and so now she wants to start from scratch, so she's now trying to to build build the same thing on her own, which is very and I didn't. I didn't. I didn't say that, or did you know? Yeah. Give her any, like, like that. She's just. That's her thought process, and it's been very interesting to watch her. Uh, so that's that's been been fun. And so, some of the kids try to remix games that are way too complicated or poorly written, and, um, and they're they're very compelling games because they're pretty good games. Uh, and so they they start to remix. They well, or actually sometimes it's like they start playing them. I said like you can't play games in the class. You gotta like. Do some programming. If you want to, you can remix these games, and uh, and so it's hard for them to tell what's going on. That's one problem with Scratch is if you have a lot of code that's distributed among a lot of different objects, mm. it's, it's a little hard to trace like how different events happen. Uh, but I've seen a few people, a few kids do it, and the, the lights go on, and it's like it's it's mind blowing when that happens. Cool. Um, I we kind of need to finish here. <laughs> um, I, I was uh, wanting to make uh, just to get some sense of how your unit ends, Kevin. I mean, you say you publish, mm -hmm. uh, and and people from the outside world respond to your kids' stuff mm -hmm. on Minecraft. Is that where you're publishing? And do you no, have some sorry. sort of? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I said okay. the name. Yeah, game. Sorry, yeah. Yep. Um, do you have some sort of um, event where kids play each other's games and so forth as well? We do. So we, you know, I, I have um, four sixth grade classes. Um, so as we kind of wrap up the unit, what we do is we um, we pull all the kids together into usually it's a cafeteria. Um, we set up computers, and uh, for a certain amount of time, um, they kind of call up their game, and other kids come over and play them, and then we just kind of switch around so they're all playing each other's games and giving feedback. And we actually have some. Um, it's usually actually before this event, but we'll have a we'll have another kind of peer feedback day too. We have uh, forms they have to kind of fill out, uh, you know, giving advice to the, to the designer about what they see in the game, good and the kind of things that can be improved. Um, and then, although I, they didn't do it last year though, but um, in other years what we've done is some kids have been taking their games to the big um, 
uh, science uh, video game challenge, which I guess didn't happen last year. I don't know. I was looking for all the information, never kind of found it. Um, which is a kind of, they had it for a couple of years a national uh, video game challenge that they opened up to middle school kids. Um, and um, so then kids would spend another couple months after our unit kind of tinkering with the games and trying to make them better before they submitted it. Um, and now we never won anything, but that kind of, um, that challenge that was out there, so maybe this is kind of the gamification part of it too, right, um, really motivated a lot of those kids to kind of take their games to another level and submit it for a national contest. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that was really powerful to be part of and kind of helped them kind of, you know, make their way through that and kind of think through it. And, um, you know, they really were serious about um, their games because they knew that it's been looked at from a whole different kind of set of eyes. Um, so I hope that's around again this year because I think you know, just having out there for some kids, not everyone did it, um, but the few that did were really kind of motivated. Um, and I just actually bumped into uh, uh, an old uh, former student the other day um, who really loved the game design unit. Um, and he's making all sorts of different games to different platforms now um, and really appreciated the fact that, you know, we did it in school. He still can't how, believe how it. How old is he now? So he's, um, he's now uh, 14. Yep. Mm -hmm. And what, what platforms has he moved to? Um, you know, he mentioned a couple that I didn't know. So, uh -huh. yeah. It's moving faster than I can even, you know, pay attention to. Yeah. Well, Kevin, thank you for sharing. And I, I'm, you know, this went really quickly for me, so <laughs> I'm learning yeah. a lot. Um, uh, something that that um, that I, the other Kevin just mentioned, um, but you uh, kind of detailed in, in everything is. Um, it's kind of like, so this is my last comment. That what I'm kind of noticing is that you open this stuff up and then you observe what the kids do. And then so that, that iterative process between mm -hmm. students and teachers feels like one important lesson that this approach with gaming allows for. So thanks for hitting that note. Um, Chris Sloan, do you have any kind of thoughts here at the end? Yeah, I have a couple of things. Um, I, I was impressed with... Um, Kevin's reaching out to the science teacher and and I think when we collaborate across disciplines it seems like um, kind of the game design takes on a even more powerful uh, connection and so that was my first thought the other one um, that I was really intrigued by was the game design and writing process continuum and how in your slide it almost ended with um, gaming seems to allow for more iterations at the end, whereas typically writing, you know, it ends with publication. Um, and so it made me think, like, how about remixing written final pieces? Interesting. Karen? Yeah, I just want to thank Kevin for sharing this, and I really appreciate a, just a different perspective on gaming, and particularly the, int the connection to students' interests and the angle of production over just consumption. Kevin Osborne, and we'll give Kevin Hudson last last word here. Oh, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry, I jumped in uh, super late, but uh, I saw a bit bit of it, and it sounds like he's doing you're doing really interesting things there. And uh, um, it, it it's uh, I think um, the interesting I think the production versus um, playing is uh, is something that a lot of kids don't even ever think about and. And, and, and some kids really respond to, uh, some kids actually are driven to, to want to do it, and then other kids, they're like, oh, wow, I can actually do this. And uh, when that light goes on, it's especially special, and, and, uh, and uh, I've I really enjoyed seeing that. And Kevin, thank you once again. And Peggy George in the chat room wants to thank you for this conversation tonight, too. Thanks. <laughs> so, but, yeah, any last thoughts that you'd like to leave us with? Well, I think uh, um, I think that idea of agency is really important. Uh, trying to show students that um, you know to make help them make that shift to creating things and you know being part of um, that idea of, of making the world and not just kind of sitting back and playing other people's games. Cool. Well, thank you for joining us tonight, Thanks. and um, we'll see you all again next week. Um, we're here every every uh, Wednesday evening. Uh, at, uh, we're a we're at a channel of EdTech Talk is 
a channel of the World Bridges Network, Jeff Lebo and Dave Cormier. Um, hooked that up several years ago. And thank you all for coming tonight. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.